All right, everybody, what's good? It's your boy BQ with the Negative BQ YouTube channel. You could say this is the return of the Power Moves podcast. You could say that if you wanted to. That was a podcast I was doing during season one of NWA. And um, I ultimately stopped doing it after about five episodes. It was doing really, really well, then kind of tailed off. Wasn't something the channel really wanted from me. Uh, So at that point, it kind of wasn't. The results were not necessarily worth my time. And this might not even do so well, you know, but um, we've rebranded from the Impact Lounge to Negative BQ. And I'm going to kind of talk about what I want to talk about sometimes. It's still going to be very Impact centric, but I wanted to get into this NWA pay per view. Typically, when I do a podcast where I'm reviewing something, you're going to see my face here. But but because it's for something in the morning, um, I am just choosing to do it like this. So you don't have to see my um, ugly face today. But I, I kind of wanted to start getting into this new era of NWA a little bit because uh, I've always watched the show, but I haven't watched consistently the last several seasons because, frankly, Velvet Sky was to commentary what Tyrus was to the world title. And it, it, I really could not listen to the show. It, it you can say whatever oh well they got away from the studio setting which was really cool or they you know got all these weird gimmicks and weird wrestlers like that didn't bother me so much i'm just a commentary guy and i could not listen to that show so now that they um you know finally made what i felt was a necessary change i was holding the product back i'm able to jump back in on a very full-time basis and um you know Previously, I'm watching the show and I'm watching on mute and that just wasn't fun anymore. So, uh, you know, now, like I said, now I'm back in on a full time basis. There's a few things and a few wrestlers and stuff. I'm still learning because I haven't seen them a whole lot in the past. But this has always been a promotion I've wanted to see succeed. I've wanted to see do well. I've always thought put on very good pay-per-views because I I did order the pay-per-views for the most part. It was just kind of the weekly show I had a hard time with. And I'm not going to beat a dead horse, but the commentary was killing me. Couldn't watch. Um, And now we've made some improvements. We have made some upgrades. NWA had the Sawin pay-per-view. I wish I could have been there. Um, Cleveland's actually, oddly enough, one of the cities I've I've been wanting to visit. And um, I, I wanted to be here for it, but because there was so much change in my life with my move and everything and my wedding, it just wasn't really in the plans for me. But hopefully I'll catch a pay-per-view in the future. Uh, But overall, I want to say the one thing that really stood out about this pay-per-view is that NWA is truly on an island of their own, which there's good and bad to that. Because sometimes you're, if you're on that island for too long, you're kind of irrelevant. But the good side of it is that they do what they want to do. They are concerned with what the NWA is doing. They're the only company, maybe MLW, but they're so far behind everyone else. They're the only company that you can say does not care what everyone else is doing. These stipulations they had, the people they chose to have in the matches, the people they chose they choose to push, they're just doing what they want to do. I do commend that. They take chances. They don't. Um, they don't worry about what's how. How's the audience going to take this? Like, I mean, of course they care, but they they take chances and see how are these people going to respond to these storylines or these gimmicks or these wrestlers. They don't want people to be versions of their WWE gimmick. They really, um, they keep it controlled, but they allow people to be themselves. And, you know, let's be real. A lot of this roster would not end up in another company. They probably would not make it onto WWE or AEW or Impact or um, even picked up by the Ring of Honor product. There's a lot of these competitors who are just, they're designed for this type of setting. NWA is not afraid to put big guys, bigger guys at the top of the card. You know, this world of of little wrestlers holding the world title and everyone has to do 50,000 flips. NWA doesn't do that. 
finishers mean something in NWA. You hit a finisher, you're winning the fucking match. Now, sometimes that's a bad thing because we'll get into this. There's there's some sloppy finishers sometimes, and they still go with the finish. But um, there's a lot that they're really, really doing well. I'm a big fan of Billy Corgan. I was a big fan of what he was doing with TNA. Yeah, he, you know, he had a couple misses, like the Grand Championship and all. But uh, for the most part, I've really enjoyed his vision. And if you listen to a Billy Corgan interview, which I kind of recommend people do sometimes, you will get a glimpse into what his vision is for the NWA. You know, they got these these uh, the rumored TV deals coming up. I say rumor because he didn't break the news. Uh, Nick Hausman did, who I think did some digging. And and people are like, well, you know, what's going to change now about compared to what they've been doing before? You know, like just basically saying they're just too small of a company. You know, how come they haven't had this kind of growth over this period of time? But if you listen to these interviews, like he he lets you know it's always been a five year plan or or you know, because we're on YouTube, I knew my limitations of what I could pay people or what I could, um, what you know, just creatively what he could do, what he couldn't do. He just always known what his limitations are because he was realistic. You know, he's come out flat out said, I can't pay CM Punk what, is worth, what he's worth. Could he? Yes. Should he? Would he? No. Because if you don't have the revenue coming in to justify a signing like that. No, you cannot pay him what he's worth. And I've said the same in regards to impact. So I'm going to make some impact comparisons throughout here because I'm an impact centric channel. But I thought um, NWA did a very good job with this pay-per-view. I'm going to get into the negatives here a little bit. First off the bat, uh, before I kind of break everything down. The venue was entirely too dark, and I don't know if that's what they were kind of going for to an extent, but it looked bad. Um, there were as, as many people there as there were at Bound for Glory, and it was just not, you know, Impact does the same thing. They don't light up the damn audience. I understand this with a themed pay-per-view, but I would have liked to have seen the people. Also, the camera angle with as many people as you had in there. The hard camera angle or the hard camera was on the ring. And then behind it, there was like an an exit. You could see a big exit sign. It's kind of an entrance exit area. And it looked so bad. And I don't understand for the life of me why they didn't put some kind of curtain up. Something. But that made it look really, really indie. And and this was not a huge venue. This was not an arena. But not just making that, just dressing up that little area, which was so, which was prominent in the pay-per-view. I don't understand. I would have put some kind of mats outside the ring instead of just a canvas. Uh, you know, it's like they were clearly in a gym or in a high school basketball court. I don't know what the venue was, to be honest, but... They were on a court. Um, there was canvas underneath. You could see it. I would have put some mats down, you know, kind of like WWE has the mats, you know. I would have done something like that. I would have just dressed this thing up a little bit more where it looked a little less indie. And, you know, I talked about the commentary as well. The, the commentary is much improved since um, removing Velvet from the equation. But during the weekly show, I think that Joe Galley and Danny Deals do a really good job. I think Tim Storm, and I respect Tim Storm very much. He should be a part of the NWA as long as he wants to be. He sucks the life out of the commentary. And when it was him and Velvet Sky on there, I mean, God bless Joe Galley for the what he was, what it, he had to work with. He's got all the energy in the world. He's a great play-by-play guy. But he, Tim Storm just does not have the charisma for commentary. I think um, they should absolutely find him a role, find him a role on screen, 
You know, I think I think he would make a good authority figure. I'm sure he's been approached about that and doesn't want to do it. I feel like he did do something like that at one point, though, before he got on commentary. I could I could be wrong about that, but I did. I don't think the commentary was unlistenable by any means. But I think they they kind of took a step back, going back to the three person booth. The other thing I'll say about the commentary, I thought it was a little silly throughout the show. I think you can get away with that on a weekly broadcast. But the pay-per-view, even though everyone was clearly having fun with this pay-per-view, you you have to, as time goes, get a little more serious as the card gets more serious. So when you've got gags, the gimp, and dudes like this, dudes like that running around, have some fun. But when you're you've got EC3 and Tom Latimer and it's the world title, and we're still just kind of cracking jokes. I don't think that works. I just feel like commentary should grow with the card. I think Billy Corgan laid out the card really, really well. But it's got a crescendo. Just like the card crescendos and builds up to a, a you know the biggest event of the show, I think you have to have that with commentary as well. To where, again, you, you're kind of having fun and, and getting into it in the beginning, and then by the time the world title match comes down that's some like some serious shit and it was very you know same thing with like kyle davis i'm not a big kyle davis fan on a uh, ring announcing and, and interviewing it, well the interviewing is fine i'm not a fan of his ring announcing personally i'm not saying he does a bad job at it we're all just different as wrestling fans right we like some things we hate some things i don't hate him i don't really like him on um his ring announcing He's not as bad as Dave Penzer and in, in, in Impact, but um, I don't really care for him. But it's kind of like the Knights of the Roundtable match comes around, and he's just like, not a roundtable. That was a round. I mean, it was just all like just so goofy. And we're talking like the tag team title match, and I just think at that point, it's time to get a little more serious. Like the tone should change in the pay-per-view. So... um that is it. That is it for my, you know, negatives for the most part. This was like a hardcore pay-per-view, and I'm not a hardcore wrestling fan. I think hardcore wrestling is dead because it's been done to death. And it hasn't been good. There's trash cans, baking lids, or baking sheets, I should say. You know, it's all the same crap, and NWA did get away from a lot of those things here when it came to weapons. You know, but you watch AEW, you watch Impact, and it's street fights every week, and it's no DQ, and it's Monsters Ball, and it's this and this, and it's staple guns that don't even have staples in them, and silliness. You know, hardcore matches are silly. That was no different here, except they made it work because... It was just unique. I was I was entertained by this. Everything was very, very unique. And, you know, the pay-per-view looked different than everything they normally do. And that's kind of what I've been asking for from Impact. Like, when I'm watching Bound for Glory, I don't want it to look like uh, the weekly Impact show. So I appreciated watching this pay-per-view because it just looked different than the show. It looked very different than a weekly show. And I think that's what you want to achieve when you're doing a pay-per-view. Now, Sawin spelled Sam Hain, horrible name for a pay-per-view, horrible. It's original, yes. But I'm always under the mindset when it comes to branding, if you cannot pronounce something or you cannot remember something, it's poor branding. So remember, you know, if, if it's a... If it's just a name that doesn't stick on the, the top of top of mind, um, you just you always forget what's the name of that pay per view, or if it's just something you can't pronounce, and and that's not just in wrestling and pay per view, that's just in everything. If it's freaking a, it's a bag of cookies. It is a the new soda coming out. If you can't remember or pronounce it, it is bad branding. But it's all good. We're going to move away from that. Again, it's a hardcore pay-per-view. They took very, uh, they took a lot of chances. They they did, and I 
appreciate that a lot as a wrestling fan. So there was a pre-show, which I did not watch. Uh, the results were Brandon Day defeating Man Bun Gina, Jesus. Country Gentleman and Jordy, Jordan Clearwater defeating Zion and the Outrunners. Samantha Starr defeating Missa Kate, Tiffany Nieves, and Celeste in a four-way to determine the number one contender for the NWA Women's Championship. And the Immortals defeating Daisy Kill and Talos to win the NWA United States Tag, champs, uh, tag Team Championship. So I did not watch those. I'm not going to lie to you. So we're not going to we're not going to run through them. First match was the Devil's Last Dance Ultimate Hardcore War. We had Judas, Maxi Impaler, Alex Misery, and Magic Inc. Um, CJ was there. They defeated Sal the Pal, Gags the Gimp, Koa Laxamana, and Magnum Muscle. Um, what I forgot to point out was that Father James Mitchell was like the master of ceremonies for, <laughs> for this whole thing. And they only showed him on screen a couple times, but his character and his gimmick did kind of set the tone for the paper. He did a lot of the promotional products and everything, uh, promotional videos. So he was out there with the Sinets, the Sinets. Yes. A group of chicks, group of baddies, if you will. I didn't like the name, the Sinets. I thought that was a little, lazy i'm sure they could have come up with something a little bit different than that but the devil's dance last dance hardcore team war so this was an elimination match but you can eliminate not just by pinfall or submission by but over the top rope and then and this is a little complicated uh impact would have complicate over complicated the shit out of this but I got what they were going for. It took me a minute, but it's an elimination match. But once your entire team is eliminated, you can send one more person back in. So if that makes sense to you guys, if you didn't watch the pay-per-view, once your team is eliminated, you basically have uh, a second chance to win the match and you're going to send one person back in. So Max was eliminated very quickly from this thing and i my initial reaction was that okay they don't want to do intergender or i don't even know what you call it with with maxi impaler but that's kind of where i went with it i was like okay they just they just want to get her out of the match that's uh, you know alicia edwards coming into bound for uh or the gauntlet for gold and uh or whatever the hell they call it uh call your shot gauntlet i'm sorry it's alicia edwards coming into the call your shot gauntlet and because she's smaller than everybody else, eliminating her in about 10 seconds. You know, Max is obviously not tiny like that, but that's kind of where I thought they were going with it. Um, Alex was eliminated next. It was a very ugly elimination. I don't remember exactly what it was. I think I think he went over the top rope as well, but it was um, very, very ugly, uh, very, very poorly executed. Um, Dak Draper went next. Cody James eliminated himself diving over the top rope. And um, man, what's her name? The female, uh, not CJ, but the other one. Uh, let me let me look it up here a little bit. See if I can. Uh, I did not write her name down. Eh, okay. Well, anyway, um, there was a point where her and CJ went at it in the ring. And CJ like beat the absolute piss out of her. Like this wasn't even a competitive little thing that it, that it did. So I just thought that was odd. Usually you bring the the chicks in, they roll around, pull some hair. You know, CJ whooped that ass. And I'm I'm a I'm a CJ guy. Met her once in real life. She is one of those uh, females that is thousand times more beautiful in person than on screen not to say she isn't on screen but there's there's sometimes those people those uh those females who will like really catch you off guard when you uh meet them in person uh she's one of them uh koa laxamana was next magic jake was next um after trying to burn mims with his cigarette uh max and max entered the ring after that not knowing that 
they, if you will, I'm going to say she uh, did not know she was eliminated. And there was a, you know, an angle going on in there. Uh, Mims then pins Jadias. And the match is, you know, the, the whole team is eliminated, but Max re-enters the match. And they pointed out this was the two time, the two TV, the first time, excuse me. It is five in the morning. I apologize. Uh, the first time that two TV champions were in the ring against each other. And then Max pins Mims, which I found really odd. I thought Mims finally getting that TV title that you just go up and up from there with him. You know, he they've had him around for a while. He's a fan favorite. He's, again, one of those dudes I don't know would end up on another company on their show. But he's really good in the NWA setting. And I I thought it was just odd that Max beat him. They introduced an ironing board into this match, by the way, which was, <laughs> I mean, like I said, there's, you know, we see hardcore matches. It's baking sheets and trash can lids, you know, an ironing board. <laughs> that was just, that was just crazy. So Mims gets pinned and then um, Gags is left. Gags gets pinned, obviously, by Maxi Impaler. Like, he's not going to do anything against her. And then Sal Lapel rolls in the ring to, you know, check on his partner. But he accidentally re-enters the match. So, when we could have had, you know, Mims or Dak Draper, one of these dudes, re-enter into the match. Probably not Mims because he was the one just eliminated and he just finished wrestling. It kind of went silly with it, but... Uh, but at the same time, it made sense within the context of the match. Sal rolls in, and then he gets pinned, and Max uh, Max wins the match. So in the beginning where I'm sitting here like, okay, well, they eliminated Max immediately so she didn't have to wrestle. Did she, she ended up winning the match. So, you know, I think I got that wrong, actually. I think Sal was the one who was pinned. I got that one wrong. I apologize. Sal was the one who was initially pinned. And then Gags was the one that accidentally volunteered himself back into the match and got pinned. Miserably faithful wins the match. So I thought, um, and then I think Gags and and Sal have to remain under Father James Mitchell or something like that. I thought this initial match did a very good job of setting the tone for the pay per view. You know, we knew we knew kind of what to expect watching this after that we got a loser leaves nwa match and this was a uh, who's in this rush freeman and brady pierce okay sorry i forgot to write the, write the names down i just wrote rush freeman and, and brady pierce and um you know this was okay uh rolando was the referee for this so he was he was basically playing like he was going to cut it down the middle or call it down the middle, um, but ultimately he was siding with um, Rush Freeman. the The story of this whole thing, though, was Matt Cardona coming down, attacking everybody, and he's been kind of a mainstay in the NWA. You know, he shows up every every so often. He's one of those dudes doesn't want to be tied down by a contract. Those will want to overstay his welcome. So he'll kind of leave. He'll he'll come back and and do his thing. But uh, you know, Rolando hits this low bro, uh, excuse me, low blow on Rush Freeman, and then we hear the oh, ways ready. Cardona comes out. He's got a history with them. He lost to Rolando at one point, but he takes him out with a chair. Um, then takes out Brady with a chair. I saw that one coming. And then he, the odd thing, he throws uh, Rush Freeman on top of Brady. And then he grabs Rolando's arm and just counts the one, two, three and causes the pin, says all, all hail the deathmatch king. I don't know if that's really going to – I don't know if that was a way of keeping Rush Freeman in the company because it wasn't an official, um, you know, official decision. I don't really know. He says, all hail the deathmatch king. He was supposed to have an open challenge. Said he should be in the main event. Starts going off about Tom and says, what kind of 
a man puts his wife in harm's way. <laughs> Just he's, you know, obviously he did a lot of those things with Chelsea Green when she was um when she was by his side, but he says, you know, he tells Tom's not going to win this match. He's going to win title of the biggest bitch in the NWA. And then he destroys Cleveland, says everything in Cleveland sucks, calls out Billy Corgan. Billy Corgan comes out. And on-screen characters, on-screen authority figures, I should say, are a little touchy on how you should deliver them or how you should present them. And... I bring it up on impact with Scott Demore. Like he tries to get himself over on screen at the expense of the talent. And I don't think that's exactly what happened here, but Billy Corgan came out with a lot of fire and he was, you know, calling Matt Cardona a liar saying he was supposed to be part of the pay-per-view, but he was delivering this promo. Like he was a battle rapper. Like he was jumping all over the place and his hands were in his face and he looked like he was just serving him with, you know, these bars. A little on the cringe side. He pulls the crowd and tells them, you know, do you want to see Matt Cardona in the world title match? Because Cardona is saying he wanted to be part of it as a three-way. And Billy Corgan tells him to go to hell. At this point, I thought Cardona should have taken Billy Corgan out. Now, what they did here, the story continued later in the show. So I could give him a pass on it. But I thought it was a great opportunity for him to hit Billy Corgan with the damn chair. I thought that would have been great. But instead, Billy Corgan, an untrained wrestler, sees him coming. And... During that small period, I don't, maybe you can call it a distraction. Camille comes in, spears Cardona, and then takes him out with a chair. So they made Cardona kind of look like a goof here. And again, if you, once we get to the world titles match, it all makes sense. But at this point here, I did not understand. I'm like, why didn't he just take out Billy Corgan? Instead, you have the female come take him out. He doesn't have a female to get his back anymore. Well, I guess. Uh, if Steph DeLander shows up with him, which I could see that very, w- very well happening. Um, but he get, you know, he gets taken out by the female, gets taken out with a chair. I thought he'd look like a huge goof instead of needing to, to you know, get over as a um, as a top heel um, for the company. But you know, it ran a little bit long, but it was it was good stuff for the most part. May Valentine is backstage next. So she is back. Um, they had Sam. I don't remember her last name. She was doing the interviewing. I think she does MLW. And I believe she did some work at the pre-show for Bound for Glory or something like that. Sam is really, really good. She is one of the most natural interviewers, I think, ever. You know, just as far as like natural conversation doesn't sound. She's not acting. It's not forced. It's not fake. May Valentine is back, though. Um, May Valentine, when she first had this role, was all sorts of horrible. But she has really grown into this. And I think she's one of the faces of the NWA. I don't feel like you can move on from her. I was hoping they weren't going to. Because she's just she's kind of become you know, synonymous with the NWA with the name. She's just She is one of the faces, even though she's not a wrestler. I think she does wrestle or can wrestle. But she's one of the faces. You can't. You can't get rid of her. You can't really replace her. Like she's kind of an irreplaceable character. But she's in the back with EC3, and EC3 is dressed like Magic Jake. I like EC3 a lot. I was a major, major fan of his in TNA. I have met him a couple times. Love EC3. I was I was down for control your narrative. Like I I'm all I'm I'm down with EC3. But I do wish that now that he's a world champion, that he would kind of return a little bit to wearing the suits like he did as Ethan Carter to the third. And especially because he's the NWA champion, even Trevor Murdoch was putting on a damn suit as the champion. EC3 kind of have this like kind of has this homeless guy look going right now. I don't really dig it. 
uh, I, w- I would love to see him kind of, I'm not saying return to that Ethan Carter to the third spoiled rich guy. Not at all. That is not what I'm freaking asking for. But I do think he looks good in a suit. I think he should kind of return to that because this is, you know, it's a pre- prestigious title, which, you know, Nick Aldis kind of set that tone where, like, you know, you have this title, you need to look the part. But, he, you know, he was, he was dressed like Magic Jake doing this interview. But he did cut a really, really good promo defending the city of Cleveland. After this, we had a junior heavyweight, falls count anywhere, pillar to post-match, Joe Alonzo versus Colby Carino. When the NWA first kind of launched, they didn't have this kind of wrestling. It, they, it was a lot more like old school with what they were doing. Ricky Starks was like their young gun. He was their lone young gun at one point, but he doesn't do this kind of style. And, you know, when they st- when they introduced this junior heavyweight division, I wasn't like really into it at first, but they were trying to, you know, trying to find their uh, their footing in modern wrestling. And we're to the point we do a pretty good job with it. And I say we, I don't know, like I'm, I'm in there uh, calling the shots. They do a pretty good job with it. Uh, but these two had a really entertaining match. There was a very obvious blade job for Carino on the outside when he, you know, obviously cl- crawled under the ring to do it and <laughs> pop back out with color. And they were fighting all over the place. I don't know how much the audience was able to follow because there's not a jumbotron at this place. This isn't like um, they're wrestling on the other side of the arena so we can kind of watch it on TV still. I don't know how much the live audience was able to really follow because they were just just all over the place. But but some couple couple you know entertaining spots. Um, eventually, a DDT was hit on the floor, um, and, you know, and they kind of played it off too, where Joe Alonzo almost had a had the win, but the ref was on the next level and couldn't get down in time to make the you know make the pin or make the count, I should say. But yeah, eventual uh, DDT on the floor for the win. Um, it was a good, for Colby Carino, it was a good blend of hardcore and the style that people want when you're seeing these two. I thought it was outside the ring a little too much. I know it's Falls Count anywhere, but I would have liked to see a little more action in the ring because that's where these guys really excel. But I, I did think it was a good blend of hardcore and then the the, the flippity doo da. Then we got... The Southern Six versus the Headbangers in a rock and roll tag team match. So they had bouncers coming down to the ring. They had bartenders. And I I connected to this. I was a bouncer for about half a year when I got off active duty. Bouncers and bartenders. And um, they've got shots. They got shot glasses. And in this match, if you do not get the three count, you have to take a shot. Okay. Uh, they started off. <laughs> I was like, "Are you? Are we? Is this legal?" You know. Um, but it, that's what I was saying at the top of the show. Like, they don't care what other people are doing. They're not trying to mimic what they see WWE do. They're just going out there and doing the NWA, and that's how you. That's what ultimately is going to work for you is creating your own niche and creating your own lane. But they start off the headbangers just start drinking whiskey. Uh, Kerry Morton, I guess, is a lightweight, kind of like myself. He didn't want anything to do with it. I thought it was funny on the outside where he uh, wanted a kiss from (laughs) one of the bartenders and she slapped him. But there was pretty decent action in this whole thing. I wasn't expecting a Matt Classic by any means, but there was a lot of kickouts, a lot of shots. There was a lot of voluntary shots, of just just drinking because they wanted to. And I don't know how drunk these guys actually were. Like if they were getting drunk, it is a pretty dangerous match to have. I would imagine the headbangers weren't feeling a whole lot from these shots. Like if it was me, like I took a shot at my wedding, and then when someone tried to give me another, I was like, I I can't right now. You know, like I'm I'm admittingly a lightweight. I'm 44 years old, but I didn't start drinking until I was 32. So uh, if it was me out there, I wouldn't have been able to wrestle. A pretty um, decent match. The Southern Six eventually wins uh, getting their feet on the ropes after one of the headbangers tried to flash him. Like he kind of lifted up his his 
kilt, if you will, try to just try to flash him or whatever. And then all of a sudden he just kind of get rolled, gets rolled up and loses. It was, a, it was a little, little flat. And then, um, because Kerry Morton was drunk and he was on the outside, he, Alex Taylor, Taylor, excuse me, Alex Taylor was left in the ring and try to celebrate, if you will, try to take some shots with the headbangers. And then they got hit with a stage dive. So that, or he got hit with a stage dive, which was almost very poorly timed and almost botched. But, uh, we saw this coming from a mile away. Like this guy loses. It, it's the stone cold thing, you know. If we he were to lose, pretends to celebrate with him and takes him out after the match. After that was a submission match. Bulletproof. Man, I'm struggling to talk today. Bulletproof Blake Troop with Chris Silvio Esquire, who I think is a great character. I really like him a lot. Uh, versus Jack Stan. This this was okay. Uh, Troop has a lot of like shoot submiss- shoot. That's hard to say. Shoot submission moves that he was unable to tap Jax out with. Jax has one submission move, and it's kind of a bullshit move in my opinion. That traps uh, trap city. I say it's bullshit because I mean, trust me. If if he came over here right now, put put that on me, it, it would probably hurt. Um, but it doesn't look like it hurts. It looks like the wrestler can get out of it very easily. Their arms aren't really that trapped. It, I don't know. I, I I think it's a BS finisher. I think, you know, the one Miro does in AEW, I think that one's bullshit too. When, when it's a normal camel clutch, it's one thing. But when you start variations of it, I just don't think it looks good. Blake Troops should have won this match. <laughs> if you're talking like in real life. If these guys were really fighting, um, and it came down to having to tap the other guy out, because some of these moves that Blake Troop was doing, uh, I did learn them in the military a little bit when I was taking a combatives course. Now I learned them on very low levels, you know, um, basic levels of of combatives, but did learn 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 some of these moves, and these moves that he's doing are. If you lock it on someone, they you you will tap out. You know, wrestling has this thing where you're able to stay in a submission move forever, or you you pass out, which is what they did here. Blake Troop passes out with the Trap City. Like you're not going to pass out from pain. It's, it's just very silly. I hate when wrestling co- companies do that. It's one thing you put them to sleep, but if you have me like in the figure four and it just hurts, I'm not just going to pass out. But a lot of these moves that Blake Troop did, like in real life, you would get an immediate tap out. There's no like, let me power through it, get to the ropes. You know, wrestling submissions, different. Like you put the Boston Crab on someone, like they're going to do their best power through it. But when you're putting guillotine chokes and things like that, I just, it's a little unbelievable for me. But um, but yeah, uh, Jack Stane wins this thing. And again, I love uh, Chris Silvio Esquire. I think he's a great character. Good look. He can talk. He's got a uh, sky's the limit for him in the NWA, I think, with whatever they you know choose to ultimately uh, do with him. Women's Tag Team Championship. This was probably the worst matchup to this point. And it was one I was looking forward to because I like Natalie Markova a lot. Or Nat- Nat- Natalia. Natal- <sighs> Sorry, I struggled with that one, but um, I like Markova a lot. Sorry. And it was her and Taylor rising. That's pretty empowered. I'm not a pretty empowered fan. I know that they're kind of seen as one of the real staples for this company and, uh, you know, big deal in the women's division. I I don't love them. Uh, but this match was not not very good. Markova and Taylor rising were dressed like two separate versions of Harley Quinn. And uh, which looked really good. Markova looked great. Uh, and they beat M95 for this title shot. I thought Markova should have beat Camille personally. I wanted Angelina Love to beat her, but I thought Markova should have beat her. I thought uh, I thought she was a good one to just to to go forward with as the champion, as someone unique. Um, I'm not really. Just the whole Pretty Empowered and Kenzie Page and Kaylee Page, I'm not like huge fans of them. I thought when 
Um, when Paige won the title, I thought it was flat. I thought she didn't um, present herself as, as someone who just beat Camille, who had been the champion for since the first Bush administration. You know, I just I didn't I didn't really care for it. But I thought Markova should have should have done it. That's what I wanted to see. But you know, they kind of got her in this title picture, tag team title picture a little bit. You know, as long as they're doing something good with her, um, I'm okay. But yes, it is Markova and Taylor Rising versus Kylie Page. Ella Envy. I just I just didn't think this was very good. There was a very bad botch. I, I, let me not say botch. Some, kind of lack of better, lack of argument. You got to say botch. And maybe it's unfair because we don't wrestle. I could not do the move. I know that for a absolute fact. But there was a bad Hurricanrana that Taylor Rising did that Taylor Envy sold anyway. Um, and then Markova hits a cutter after that, and it's a bad cutter. I think the cutter is one of the worst moves in wrestling. No one can hit it outside of Randy Orton, Diamond Dallas Page. Even freaking QT Marshall can hit it. Everyone else looks like complete shit. It doesn't look devastating. It doesn't look like it hurts. It never hits cleanly. But it somehow beats people because Randy Orton beats people with it. So, But but it's one of the most overused moves in wrestling. And I just wish we could get away from this. The fans were into this match. I'm not going to... Deny that. They were into it. They liked the people involved. Um, there's a sloppy code Kylie for the win at the end. It, this was just not a very good match. I was looking forward to it. Again, because just Markova was in it, but I didn't really care for it. I didn't think it was very good. Throw Billy Silas Mason took on Chris Adonis, and this is kind of exactly what I'm saying, where I'm like, yo, they're on their own island. No other company would have done this match on a pay-per-view. They would probably would have done this show on TV and given it more than two minutes. Because big guy wrestling is not really a thing anymore. Now, I kind of come from the old school, so I don't mind it. I like it. I've never been a fan of seeing people roll around the ring and dive and kick out of everything and light each other on fire and still kick out it too. Like, that's not a thing for me. So I can I can get into a match like this. There was a pretty bad double axe handle off the top rope. <laughs> uh, Billy did. Um, so yeah, every move here has its, you know, every I mean, every match here has one or two moves that just came off so bad. Uh, Tim Storm did a good job of saving it on commentary. That's what you should do. But he ultimately hit the throw ride for this win. This was not a very long match. So even though I said, you know, no other company would have given it time, maybe NWA didn't want to give it time either. <laughs> but they're they're more likely to give guys like this some time. But uh throw Billy wins. Again, not very long. I I didn't see the 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 match ending that quickly. It just kind of like out of nowhere was over. Then we had a riddle box match, the but brothers of fun struction and violent J versus La Rebellion and Vampiro. And as I said, I haven't been following the company as closely as I had in the past just because of the commentary thing. When they announced this match, I was conf- concerned because I thought Vampiro was sick. But I guess he was able to wrestle. They they took him out immediately in the beginning of the match. So that's that's where I was like, that's like the time impact about four years ago, but Conan in the ring. And, you know. They took him out before the match because he wasn't not really fit to wrestle. I mean, in real life. That's kind of where I thought they were going to do here, but Vampiro actually returned. It was just part of the story where he got hurt, but he he took part in this match. And with this riddle box match, there's just boxes all <laughs> over the ring. Some of them have weapons, some have silliness. And you can get away with a match like this because it's this kind of pay-per-view. The tone has been set. Um, the brothers of Fun Struction and Violent J, like they're freaking clowns, they're juggalos. Like you, you can do it. You can do it. But there was slingshots. 
uh, meatballs. There was a rubber chicken at one point in one of these boxes. And then in the middle of the match, there was one box that had, throw, that, that had dolls and T-shirts in them, and they started throwing the, the dolls into the T-shirts into the crowd. Um, then there was a big box that had a jack-o'-lantern in it. And this is one of those things I thought the uh, commentary was getting very silly, like, oh, no, not the jack-o'-lantern, not the pumpkin. Just a, just a little silly for my taste. The, Joe Galli did a lot of scream. I don't know. So I do know about audio editing a little bit. But as far as like live recording with audio, I don't have any experience with that. As far as um, I do as like as a, as a recording artist type of thing, but something like this where it's a live broadcast and everyone has to have their own individual sound settings. I don't know much about it, but Joe Galli is always so much louder than the other two. And then he starts yelling and it is distorted and does not sound good. And then you go, Tim, you know, I, I just can't believe that for the love of humanity. And then Storm, yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think that was a pretty cool move, you know. Like, I just noticed that throughout the pay-per-view. It was kind of just driving me crazy. Anyway, there was a jack-o'-lantern. There was a pie. Of course, there's going to be a pie. There was a balloon. There was a balloon pop in the face, which he hit him with a balloon and it popped. I thought that was <laughs> actually kind of funny. And then uh, at the very end, they got Violent J and Vampiro, you know, facing off one on one, but very quickly, within like 15 seconds, Violent J hits a nail in the coffin. Vampiro's old move onto the thumbtacks because thumbtacks are in one of the boxes and gets the win. So this is one of those matches I'm sure for the people there in the arena, they really had a good time with it. It was silly, but it worked. And all these matches, they're hardcore, but they're, they're, this wasn't like WWE TLC where there's a chairs match and then a ladders match. And then there's a, you know, where it wasn't silliness. It was silliness, but it wasn't, it was believable. And every match they did such a good job with having its own gimmick that, you know, nothing felt like you were watching the same crap for, for three hours, you know? They really were able to differentiate things. And then it shows Father James Mitchell after this, like snorting Coke with the Sinets. I mean, <laughs> this guy was really gone. He he really was sloshed. He was, I mean, he you could tell this dude was fucked up. But it it um allowed for a pretty good moment. It's pretty funny. Then we got Kenzie Page versus Ruthie J. I'm pretty high on Ruthie J. I think this girl can really, really do some things in the wrestling business. She's athletic, but she's like a good athletic. She's not like a bad athletic like Trinity or something like that. Where um, I, you know, Trinity is a star. Don't get me wrong, but I mean the moves are sloppy. You know, she jumps up to hit someone, but she actually accidentally like jumps over them or something. You know, just just. A, a lot sometimes you're too athletic for your own good and it's sloppy but um ruthie j is excellent she, she's uh really really good i think um with some development and some some good opponents like she could be at the top of this thing one day you know and, and be be holding the burk but i'm i'm very impressed with her i'm glad that they made her the number one contender i'm trying to remember who she wrestled who uh she took on for the number one contender match i don't remember. I don't even remember if it was one-on-one. -on -one. I think it was a four-way. I'm pretty sure it was a four-way match. I just can't think who else was in it. I think Mr. Kate might have been in it. I don't really know. But Ruthie J, sky's the limit for this girl. Kenzie Page is pretty good. I don't think she's that good, though. Again, I thought they, her beating Camille, Camille was flat. And I don't think she showed the... <sighs> I don't know. She just didn't have that kind of reaction. It doesn't matter if you're a heel or a baby face. Like if you beat someone who's been the champion for like two, three years or whatever, like you can't just act like you just rolled up some jabroni in a squash match. And that's how I thought she kind of sold it. And I, I don't know if her as a champion is going to, they're going to commit to her. They commit to their champions. You cannot argue that, but I just don't know if it's going to go. 
and see the heights that they that it did with Camille. But who knows? I know that again. This is this is some of the people do like. They are into the the character. She's not my favorite wrestler in the world, but I thought she looked pretty good here. I thought her and Ruthie J had a pretty good match. Actually, they they work very well. Kenji Kenji Page is a lot better than Pretty Empowered. So if you're going to put a title on someone, you put it on her. I think she's much much better than them. And again, they had a good match here. It had a bad finish where Ruthie J went for a frog splash off the top rope. Kenzie Page moves way too early. Ruthie J still goes for it. And then Kenzie hits a bad cutter. I'm sure she calls it the Kenzie cutter. I haven't paid attention. Hits a bad cutter and gets the win. So, you know, as I was saying at the top of this thing, like when there's a finisher, you're going to hit that finisher. NWA, you're going to win the match. It doesn't matter if the finisher looks good or not. You're going to win, which... I can appreciate. I don't like kicking out of finishers. But that was the blemish on this match. It was good, but the finish was the blemish. Almost done here. Knights of the Round Table match. Blunt Force Trauma, which is Carnage and Damage, versus Knox and Murdoch. I wrote down that you could see the winner of this match coming from a mile away through a brick wall. I thought for sure Knox and Murdoch were going to win. I'm not a Murdoch fan. I know they put the title on him at one point. I didn't buy it personally. He's one of the faces of the NWA, though, so I'm, I will give him his respect for that. He's not my favorite wrestler in the world. I wouldn't have put the title on him personally. I wouldn't put any title on him. But he fits in what the NWA is doing. The hard hitting action. They, he he works and he has a fan base. There are people who appreciate him. Mike Knox, I don't know that he would be in another company right now, but uh, he fits good in the NWA as well. All these guys, um, they just they, they're they're great fits for the company. And then they've got knights coming out. There's a wizard. There's Lord. Eric Smalls, the gesture, uh, May Marion. I think they called her May Marion. I couldn't c- tell if they were saying May Marion. They just sound so similar, but I think they were saying May, but it was May Valentine. I was going to say May Young for a second. I thought they had a good use of the tables. So this is a Knights of the Round Table match, so they have to go through a round table, which those were set up by where the Knights and May was and all that. So they had regular tables. <clears throat> Excuse me. I thought they did a good job of of utilizing them. You know, I, I thought again, Kyle Davis with a not a round table. I thought was really really hokey in the semi main event where they, you really have built up to because uh, Aaron Stevens was banned from ringside. You have built up to this. You cannot beat blunt force trauma because Aaron Stevens will do whatever it takes. To win the title, to to keep the titles, they've built up this big, you know, story, this environment, this snowball to where Knox and Murdoch just can't quite get over the hump, and this is the night they're going to do it. And we're just kind of cracking. We're still cracking jokes on commentary. <clears throat> Excuse me, the ring announcing silly. So I thought that took away from the match. I like seeing Marche Rocket in this position. I'm a fan of his um, as a wrestler, as a person. So I like seeing him in this position. I thought for sure Knox and Murdoch were going to win. And this was really well done to when where one of the knights takes out I don't uh, Mike Knox, hits him, knocks him out cold. And of course, the commentary has to sell it as like, Sell it as like, you know, why is he knocked out cold from one punch? It's because it was Aaron Stevens with the loaded glove. And then they put Mike Knox through the round table. Kyle Davis got to be like, that was a round table. I just thought this match, if we had a more serious tone for it, could have been a really, really good story. I still, I still... Enjoyed it. I enjoyed the pay-per-view as a whole. 
but I nitpick. That's just what I do. I thought the I just thought it would have added a lot more. Um, clearly, this storyline is going to continue until Knox and Murdoch win the championship. But the way I see it, this was no disqualification. I know he was banned from ringside, but they lost. So I think if you have blunt force trauma, just move on from them. I think it gets them over. But if they do this to where in the back of our minds, it just means they're going to wrestle again and lose. That does nothing for BFT. Main event time, Tom Latimer versus the Overman, EC3. This was a no-limits match, which just meant no rules. Like Jim Cornette would say, lazy booking. But yeah, this this was just a street fight. That's what it was. No no holds barred, basically, but they called it no limit. No limits. Tom Latimer relinquished the TV title in order to have this opportunity. I thought they had a very good build up to it. I thought some good promos were being cut. I think adding Camille again as the the enforcer or the insurance policy, I think that's what people want to see out of her. Even though she had a great title run, the most pot I don't want to say the most popular, but the most positive I think people saw her was when she was kind of the bodyguard of Nick Aldis and she was silent. Because once she stopped, once she started, excuse me, once she started talking and had the accent, a lot of people lost interest <laughs> they did trust me if you don't think that was the case uh, a lot of people say you know i want her to go back to not talking but camille um in this role i think people were really excited for it and hopefully tom is the champion at one point with camille by a side like this as the insurance policy that would be a great run i knew tom wasn't going to win this match and this was an okay match, but they're from two guys that I like a lot. I liked them a lot in TNA. Um, again, the commentary still very silly throughout this match. Tom Latimer coming out dressed like the Macho Man, and Camille dressed like Elizabeth. I just don't think you do that for the main event. If you are wrestling in the middle of the card and you are defending the TV title for the 50th time, maybe not 50th, the 7th, I just think that's what you do. If you if that's where you're at in the card. If you're in the main event, I don't think you cosplay. Just my my thoughts. But this match was um was decent. It was what you expected from these guys. You know, they weren't going to go on and have this like Matt classic, but they did have a, you know, the night built up to it. The show's built up to it. And I'm, you know, I'm excited for EC3's title run. They use the chair quite a bit as we, these orange chairs that we saw through some of the shows. And I was glad it was orange because it popped a little with this dark arena. I thought the orange popped a little. So uh well done with that if it was a black chair it would just been like you know just blended in with everything else ultimately um camille accidentally gets taken out and where the match happened here was cardona then runs out because remember there was this whole story with he wanted to be involved in this match billy corgan told him to go to hell camille took him out he shows down and he's you know he he shows up I'm struggling to talk this morning. I'm sorry it's early. He shows up and he's going to give Camille the reboot because she is in the corner there. I don't remember the exact spot where Camille got taken out. But it was well done. She's just laying there in a corner. Cardona's gonna come hit the reboot. Tom Latimer goes to cover her to protect her. And then in that slight distraction, ECD, I mean, EC3 gets the advantage, the upper hand, and then hits the ECD, which he, in TNA, he called it the ECD, the EC driver. I think it's a stupid name. I don't know if that's what he still calls it, but that is ultimately uh, what he won, like a, you know, butterfly face buster type of move. But that's ultimately what he hits. Uh, to win the match and retains the title. So they did it in a way where Tom Latimer didn't look weak for losing. 
He goes, we knew Tom Latimer was going to lose. And him, as I said, he would make a good champion one day with Camille by his side. It's not time for that yet. But we also don't want Tom to just kind of like lose clean in the ring. So I thought this did a good job of setting up something a little more long-term with Tom Latimer and Matt Cardona. And then ultimately, Matt Cardona is going to obviously challenge for the championship. But we're not, this isn't like Impact WWE, AEW, where you wrestle for the title the next week. I think there's going to be a longer story here. Um, Latimer is going to get, you know, he's going to get back to the title picture. Cardona is going to do this pick, this um, program with him, probably get into the title picture. You know, I think it's all being paced out very well, and very well done. So good pay-per-view by NWA. I give them props for this. Um, it is the new era, and uh, they took chances. As I said, they took some swings. They just they don't care what other companies are doing. They're going to push who they want to push and do it the way they want to and just present wrestling how they want to present it, and that's um, that's all you can ask for as a fan. So, you know, I, I give this a good um, good 8 out of 10 for a pay-per-view. There was uh, some sloppy wrestling in it, but, you know, for the most part, all the right people won. So I'm your boy, BQ. Thanks for checking out my review of NWA Sawin. I'm out. Peace.